Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Helen and I'm part of the team at Christian Music Ministries. If you don't know who we are, we're an organisation who love to share the good news of Jesus through musicals. And we also have a passion for equipping the local church, both through teaching about music in worship and life in the spirit. This year, due to the coronavirus pandemic, we at CMM have not been able to hold many events at all. And we're so sad about this. We're particularly sorry not to be able to hold our music weeks where we get to worship and perform alongside so many wonderful friends and family. Usually at these weeks we would have worship, Bible teaching and rehearsals culminating in a performance on the final evening. So this video is an attempt at a replacement for that, although of course nothing can beat meeting up in person. We're going to have a little bit of worship, followed by some teaching from Roger, including some songs to join in with. Most excitingly, just like with the Music Weeks, this evening is going to culminate in a performance. Friends from across the UK and even beyond have sent in their videos and it has all been put together. So even though we can't meet face to face, we will at least get to see each other's faces. It's also great to hear a full orchestra playing Annie's wonderful arrangement. Before we get on to that, we can't have a CMM event without notices and we're thrilled to say that during lockdown, Roger has been creative and he's composed a complete new musical based on a play by our friend Jane Hicks. It's called Three Wise Camels and we hope to premiere it probably similarly to this later in the autumn. So keep your eyes on our news to find out more. We also have a few book projects on the go and we hope to release one of these, um, the Bible studies to accompany Torn Curtain, which have been written for us by Dave Gidney. Sometime in September, they should be coming out. So now we're going to begin the rest of our evening and we start with worship and our friends on the Isle of Wight have created a video for us, um, a lyric video of the, of the psalm that Roger wrote, God is our shelter and strength. Many of you will know it from the musical Jailbreak, so do join in and sing along and let's worship him together.
Hi there. I'd like to talk to you today about music in the Bible. And there's plenty of stuff in the Bible that we can find. You go through the Old Testament, you get music from Genesis chapter 4 onwards. And of course, you've got the amazing book of Psalms, the big hymn book of the Bible right there in the heart of the Old Testament. But then when you get to the New Testament... Not so much specific references to music, there are some, and particularly I'd like to draw those out with us today as we particularly think about psalms, hymns and songs. The two references I'm particularly thinking about is, of course, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, and Colossians 3, 16. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs and make music in your heart to the Lord. And it's almost as if he's saying the same thing, but slightly different and personalised to Colossians. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. Well, actually, I've looked at the um, the text of uh, the, the, the Greek for psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, and we don't get much of a clue as to what he actually meant. But what, of course, we can do is we can think, how does this apply today? First of all, there's quite a principle about those two verses. Neither of them start with music. They both start with God touching our lives. And Ephesians... Chapter 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. To Colossians 3, it's let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The important thing is, before we get to the music making, there's something more important. It's God coming upon our lives. I made music for many years before I got to know Jesus. I was even a church organist. But it really began to make sense and all come together. It was when I gave my life to Jesus and began that relationship with him. And that was only the beginning. Then the music started to fit together. And that's the, the, the principle that Paul seems to be saying in his two verses. And of course the, the result of it is making music in your heart to the Lord and singing with gratitude in your heart to the Lord. So I've kind of looked at it uh, in this way. There's a, there's a golden oldie song, When I Feel the Touch, and uh, I think it expresses Paul's teaching. It goes, so join in if you like, it goes something like this. When I feel the touch of your hand upon my life, it causes me to sing a song that I love you, Lord. So from deep within, my spirit singeth unto thee. You are my King, you are my God, and I love you, Lord. Not the greatest piece of music, um possibly not the greatest lyrics, but yet, in a way, it says it like not many other songs do, that express Paul's teaching about psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You see, when we actually look back at those verses, as I said, there's an input. There's something that comes first. Be filled with the Spirit. Let the Word of Christ dwell in your riches. That's spirit and truth. And Jesus even talks about that in his discourse with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. But you see, spirit and truth inputting our lives, our expression, the data that comes out is psalms, hymns and songs. And we'll look at the more meaning of that in a minute. But notice the outward expression. The, the ultimate reaction to that is the output is speak to one another and also sing to the Lord. It seems to me that it's when God touches our lives, then we begin to see how worship happens. Because, as we will think about later, we love because he first loved us. We worship because he first worshipped us. We can sing a song to the Lord because in Jesus he's singing a song to us. So let's have a look then at Psalms. Um, you all know where Psalms are. You can get, as I said, the book, the centre of the Bible, the book of Psalms. And of course, Psalms express, I guess they, that express a statements of truth and intent. The psalmist was very immediate. If he was rejoicing, he'd say so. If he was anxious, he'd say so. If he was down in the dumps, he'd say so. 
And it's almost as if there's a psalm for every reason, a psalm for every season. And I do recommend to you the, the validity of um, singing and reading and meditating on the psalms, because wherever we're at, there'll be a, a psalm for us. And you think of some of the psalms. I mean, the most well-known psalm of the lot, of course, the Lord is my shepherd, people sing it at at baptisms, at weddings and funerals, but we should do it at more than that. Because you see, it's the way the famous tune Crimmond. Beautiful. I used to think it was actually a beautiful English hymn tune. It's actually from Scotland, and I actually discovered the village of Crimmond somewhere in the north of Scotland. Of course, the whole thing about Crimmond, that tune, it was one of the in the tradition of the Scottish metrical psalms. So they were singing psalms, but they actually turned them into metrical meter, almost turned them into hymns, so that we can have one tune that that goes through the, the verses, easy to sing. But of course, there's lots of ways. I mean, this is still very, very Western, very British. You see, the thing is that David wasn't a Scotsman or an Englishman, he was an Israeli and maybe the tune for the Lord to my shepherd to him may be more like. The Lord's my shepherd I would want, he makes me down to life. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. And then he goes on, la 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 Well, that's very Israeli, isn't it? But maybe, what if David was um, born in the Austrian Tyrol and he still wanted to set Psalm 23? It might go something like, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. And you probably know the chorus of that. But uh, you see, there are many, many ways of singing psalms. There's the beautiful Anglican cathedral method of chants in pointing, but there's also the folky type music style to, I guess, to fit our culture. So there's the Lord's My Shepherd, lots of different ways of doing it. And also a, a hymn or a psalm rather like, God is our shelter and strength. Um, God is our shelter and strength is a statement of truth and the, the psalmist is saying, even if the, the, the seas rise and the hills fall and whatever, he will still be a mighty fortress. So that's Psalm 46. But of course, I want you to know that with all the psalms, there are actually psalmy bits in other parts of the Old Testament that aren't in the book of Psalms. For example, in 1 Chronicles 29, we have yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, the majesty. All things come from you and of your own do we give you. Anglicans often say that when they're bringing the bread and wine and the offering up to the altar at the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer. But it's a psalm. It's declaring truth about God and not giving any more thought to it. It's just saying that's the truth about it. Whether you like it or not, that's the truth. Something immediate about the psalms. But did you know? that actually we can cross into the New Testament and we can also find Psalms. You know, at the beginning of Luke, the first two chapters of Luke's Gospel, I've identified four Psalms. Can you guess what they are? If I said Mary's song, you'd say, oh yeah, I know that, that's the Magnificat, the song that Mary sang after the angel Gabriel had visited her. And then still in early Luke, you've got the Nunc Dimittis, son of Simeon, when he holds the baby in his arms and he just prophesies. And it's a psalm, and you look in the NIV version of the Bible, it often indents these so you can spot the psalms. And then there's the, the Benedictus, what we call it, as the, uh, the, the, the son of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, who again prophesied after he knew what was going to come about with John the Baptist being born to his wife Elizabeth. Well, that's three. There's another one. Yeah, um, there's one more in early Luke. Easy to, to, to miss it, but it's the, the song that the shepherds heard while they were watching their flocks or watching their socks at night and all heaven broke loose and they heard the words glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. And that's very brief there in Luke, but it's like a psalmy bit that the church has taken down through the centuries and turned into a Trinitarian psalm of praise or what we call the Gloria. But actually, I'm going to suggest there's even more psalmy type 
bits where we just describe and declare an immediacy and an awareness of God. In, for example, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul is talking about having the mind among you that you have in Christ Jesus. And he talks about Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God made himself nothing and of course it goes on to say and God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above all names. That's what we've often known as the song of Christ's glory that uh, Paul quotes and uses in Philippians 2. It's very much a psalm. But if you really want the absolute example of psalms in the New Testament, get to the end of the book, this wonderful finish to the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And if you just look through it, you'll find loads and loads of psalm-type passages. You know, I once thought I was going to write, when it was writing Angel Voices, I thought, we'll set the whole of the book of Revelation. And of course, that was too big a, a task that we had to take aspects of it. But it was easy to spot the psalms from the worthy of you and the glory to God and the hallelujah. In fact, Handel, of course, picked up the hallelujah chorus from that. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. All these are psalm events that just praise God. And uh, of course, as I said, when we go back to think even about the Old Testament Psalms, there's a psalm for every reason, a psalm for every season. We're going to listen to Devon Brown, one of our soloists, who sings a setting that we've done of Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I think there's just absolutely beautiful words. We had to set this song, and here's Devon Brown. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, He is my fortress, He is my God in whom I trust. He will save you from many dangers. From the deadly diseases He will cover you under His wings In His arms you'll be safe He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High Will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, He is my fortress, He is my God, in whom I trust. You will not fear the nightly terror, nor the threats that come daily. Though a thousand will fall by your side, you will come to no In the 
shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, He is my fortress, He is my God. I trust he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, he is my fortress. In the shelter of the Most High, He is my God, in whom I trust. Well, a brief look at Psalms, but actually let's move on because Paul talked about Psalms, hymns and songs. And of course, yeah, well you all know what hymns are, we've been singing hymns virtually all our lives, but of course hymns kind of, the good hymns, are thoroughly biblical, even taking bits of the Psalms or other parts of, of biblical truth, but with the skill of the hymn writer, the poet, turning these beautiful truths into poetry and generally metrical words, but deepening our understanding of the truth. It's almost like you have the Bible reading, then you have the sermon, and the hymns are like the, the sermon of the Psalms. It's bringing it to our notice, it's personalising us, uh, it for ourselves. So hymns are a kind of understanding of the truth. Take for example, famous hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, words by Isaac Watts, one of our greatest ever hymn writers. You, you know, realise that this hymn at one time was uh, outlawed because it was too emotional and people said, why do we need new songs? We've got the old ones. Well, here comes When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Lots and lots of beautiful stuff, not quite quotes from the Bible, and yet as you look through the verses, thoroughly biblical, which of course the, the climax and the challenge at the end demands, such love demands my soul, my life, my all. That's Isaac Watts. And of course we can't talk about hymns without thinking about Charles Wesley. He wrote hundreds of them, some of them in many, many verses that we actually don't sing today. But one that we well, we know, well known is, uh, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood? He based most of this thinking on Paul's teaching in the book of Romans, and yet hardly a quote, and yet it's absolutely full of Romans teaching. And uh, you get that beautiful verse, and uh, when the dungeon flamed with light, God came, uh, this, this great light come, and, and Wesley talks about that. It's as if he was probably thinking about Paul and Silas in Philippi. Amazing song, worth lots of different tunes to it actually. And then Charlotte Elliot, a life not with, that was easy, not without pain and suffering, but wrote this beautiful symbol hymn, Just As I Am Without One Plea, a hymn that's been sung down the ages. It's sung at Billy Graham campaigns. I can remember singing one tune to it, um, hymn number 349 in Hymns Ancient and Modern. And it's Just As I Am. Every verse starts with Just As I Am an honesty of starting, and the next two lines of every verse uh, he's expressed in beautiful poetry some aspect of her coming to God, and sums it up at the end of every verse with probably at the most psalm-like expression, O Lamb of God, I come. But simple verses, and yet developing and teaching the whole aspect of the Lamb of God who we can come to just as we are. Of course, if we move into more recent times, Graham Kendrick's written lots and lots of super songs, psalms and hymns, but I particularly want to highlight what one of, I think, his greatest hymns, uh, and that's The Servant King, which, of course, starts um, with the... Well, first of all, it has a chorus that has, This is our God, the Servant King, but starts with the nativity, From heaven you came, helpless babe. Incredible, creedal statements, but hardly a quote of scripture in them, yet thoroughly scriptural. The one line, hands that flung 
stars into space. What beautiful poetry to cruel nails surrendered. And uh, you, you can't get better than this. This, this is a, a beautiful hymn with lots and lots of verses. And if we move more into present day, of course, we've got Stuart Townend, who you, you couldn't talk about hymns without Stuart, with all his many, many hymns. He's written songs as well, but hymns with lots and lots of verses. And of course, one of his early ones was how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure. Again, you see, Lots of words, that's the thing about hymns. Hymns have words, and we mustn't be afraid of lots of words. Uh, but it, as long as we, get, don't, we, we don't get too many and we get lost up with them. But you see, seriously, how deep the Father's love for us. I came across a, a CD of Maddie Pryor, uh, and, uh, the, the folk singer, and she was with the Carnival Band, and she did a whole album of gallery hymns. And they were actually, um, it was about taking the style of our traditional hymns and singing them in some way, the way a, in the way a gallery band with all the sack butts and all the other things they'd have had up in the gallery, swinging along with great rhythm. And of course, what happened is that uh, it was that gallery band was a bit of a rebel, and so it was lovely to have the organ appear, so the organ could be brought down and the organ could do all of it. But of course, actually, here's something controversial to say: I don't think the organ can do all of it. The organ is a wonderful instrument; it's one of my instruments, but it's not the only one that we should use in church. And it's interesting that once we, we used to have a gallery band that was replaced by the organ, and now in many churches we've kind of got the move to replace the organ with the band. Not quite a gallery band, but with a praise band or whatever. You know what? There's an idea that we should have one or the other, and I'm saying we can have both. The, the contemporary band, the traditional choir, the traditional organ. Why not mix the whole thing together? But really the point I'm making here is that hymns, well, Maggie Pryor says, they were quite controversial. From the, the, the notes on her CD, she, she says this, what made hymns so different from the old metrical psalms was their expression of personal religious thoughts and feelings in vigorous and emotional language. They spoke of God's love for sinners, salvation for the individual, the liberating power of Jesus, the inner experience of the Holy Spirit and the promise of future glory. And she goes on to say, this was abhorrent to most of the Anglican establishment. Um, shrieking with horror there at the thought that we could ever be uh, some way not coping with such brilliant teaching. However, she says, in time, even the Church of England could absorb many of the hymns into its worship. You know, for me, I love to set old hymns to new tunes. I've made a few enemies that way. I hope I've made a few friends as well, but I want to take for a moment about just as I am without one plea. You know, the thing about singing a different tune to the well-known words is it can suddenly bring out more of the truth. Familiarity doesn't necessarily breed contempt but it can breed immunity and when you put a different tune to words that you've been singing for years you might think oh, I never realised it. We've had people actually say that. So we're going to have um, a setting now sung by Helen Pollard and Anne Steer, a setting from our musical rock. Join in if you can with uh, Just As I Am Without One Play. See you next week.
Precious healing of the mind Yes, all I need in Thee to find O Lamb of God, I come Just as I am Well, if I've been treading on any toes or being a bit controversial about new tunes to old hymns, we must continue with Paul's teaching and it's psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Now remember, if psalms are kind of immediacy, statements of truth and intent, honest expressions of where it's at, and hymns are like the sermons to all that, where the hymn writer has put it into prose and developed and helped to understand uh, the, the concept of what's going on to help us to understand it, Songs is where World War Three can, of course, break out because songs are more akin to our experience. So therefore, they're going to be simpler, they're going to be emotional, they're going to be more direct and probably very much more controversial because they're also quite challenging. They're starting to get quite personal. You see, here's an example of a song. Abba, Father, let me be. Wonderful uh, song by my friend Dave Bilber. It starts low in the register. You don't want to be up high. With, with intimate songs, it's got to be low. Abba, Father, let me be yours and yours alone. I actually said to Dave, you know, I'm really envious of that because Abba in alphabetical hymn books gets you towards the front. And I've not been able to beat that one yet. <laughs> but seriously, the intimacy. And even the word Abba is the intimate word for Father. It's the, it's the word that Jesus uses at the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. It's Abba. It's Daddy. It's intimacy. And this is the place, of course, for songs. Another song that we've got is I Just Want to Praise You, Lift My Hands and Say I Love You. This is from the vineyard of the 1980s, 1990s. But uh, I just want to praise you, lift my hands and say I love you. But I want you to notice the use of the word just there because this is not a theological just. This is nothing to do with justification. It's the turn of phrase and I've counted many hundred of these in, in our improvised prayers, where we just say, I just, I just want to praise you, Lord. And we can sometimes colloquially have lots and lots of justs in one paragraph. I just love to be here, here. just as we are, Lord. It's just great just to be here, just like this. And OK, we're not going to build our doctrine about it, but you see, it's actually expression of intimacy, a love language that relaxes. And we talk colloquially because Jesus said, I'm not just called you servants. I'm not calling you servants. I'm calling you my friends. And when I'm with my friends, I don't have to have all the posh language. I can just be me. So there's that one. And then there's uh, Matt Redmond. When I stand before your throne, he's written many beautiful worship songs. But this one for me is one of the absolute best because it talks about 
eventually when we stand before the throne of Jesus and we will worship. And this beautiful hymn that has this descending melody that's rich in its lyric but yet simplicity. Just beautiful. And of course, My Jesus, My Saviour, one that uh, a few years ago Darling Check from Hillsong brought out. Interestingly, again, the melody starts low. My Jesus, my Saviour. And he goes... But it's still kind of low, but later on, after she's done the My Jesus bit, he goes, Shout to the Lord on the earth. And, you know, it's big then. It almost becomes a psalm. But I guess the clever bit of her mel mel melody writing is my Jesus and it's low think about my Jesus how can we say my Jesus to the one who is the Lord of Lords the King of Kings the Lamb upon the throne the creator and sustainer of the universe the saviour of the world who amazingly I can say my Jesus my Jesus. That's because of the intimacy and the personal relationship that we can have with God. This is not being irreverent. In fact, when we're in God's presence and we're not informal and honest, we're actually being irreverent. There's a place where at I think we just need to give up religion and it's all about relationship. And of course, a song that's written in recent years by Phil Wickham, I see your face in every sunrise. And... Uh, it's beautiful, and it just looks at Jesus and says, you're beautiful. And if you're struggling to be able to say to God, you're beautiful, I want you to imagine the look on someone's face of a person who loves you without reservation, with no strings attached, and knowing us completely, even our innermost being, and he says, I love you. I think that, that look of love is the most beautiful sight we could ever see. And that's, I guess, at the, the centre of the songs. They're not psalms, they're not hymns, they're songs. Graham Kendrick put it like this. I tend to liken it to a human love relationship. There are times when you're communicating content, and then there are the sweet nothings. Sometimes too many words can get in the way. I remember uh, I was invited to talk about this sort of thing to a group of, I was told it was going to be senior Anglican clergymen, so I was expecting bishops. I actually got vicars over 40, but that was all right. And I talked about how um, in, in intimacy of a relationship, um, we will say to the one whom we love, we will say, I love you. And I said that when I get home after going away for many times on itinerant ministry, I don't just come back and uh, have a speech prepared uh, across the living room for my wife saying, darling, your housework is magnificent, your cooking is beyond compare. Incidentally, it's important that she, she knows I do think that, but actually in the relationship it's going to be, oh, I love you. In other words, then I'm not going to tell you, but you'll know what I mean. The words are going to get simpler, the lyrics are going to get simpler, the, um, the syllables are going to get less. And the words aren't going to get the way. Well, anyway, at this meeting with the senior Anglican clergy, uh, one man then came up to me, one retired vicar, and he said, hmm, it's all very well. He said, but how many times have you told your wife you love her? And I said, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't keep count. He said, do you know how many times I've told my wife? Once. I didn't need to tell her again. Uh-huh. Well, I'll leave you to think about what you, how you react to that. But it was C.S. Lewis who wrote these amazing words that could help us to understand spiritual songs. He says, It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. I love you. If you're in love with someone, actually you can just mention their name. I did hear one uh, really um, traditional uh, musician once say, oh, I saw it in a hymn book the other week, it went, Jesus, 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 copyright. Well, <laughs> seriously, it just didn't need the word copyright. But there are times to sing the name of the one with whom we're in love. And here's an example in West Side Story. Tony's in love with Maria. And he's got one song where the lyric writer just got it right. He goes, Maria... Maria. Say it loud and there's music playing. Say it soft and it's almost like praying. Then he has a coda and it goes, Maria, Maria, Maria. And that's what the intimate worship song 
is about, as I say, a bad hymn, but a wonderful song. Some of our hymns are very bad songs. But here we've got some wonderful, simple songs. I discovered this a few years ago, and uh, bear with me. It's from a hymn book I found, and it goes like this. Come kiss me with those lips of thine, for better are thy loves than wine. And as the power of ointment be, such is the savour of thy name. And for the sweetness of the same, the virgins are in love with thee. Now I actually found that in a hymn book, and yet it wasn't in legend and modern, it was a bit more ancient than that. But actually you realise, you may think, okay, that's, that's based on the Song of Solomon, isn't it? But actually the hymn itself I found in From Hymns and Songs of the Church by Orlando Gibbons. 1583 to 1625. You know, this intimate worship song idea isn't a newfangled thing. It's always been there in the church. That's why we can have pieces like, and don't wait to Christmas before you do that. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Repetition's all right, and particularly maybe with a simple repetitive song like this, which means, I adore you, O Lord. this intimacy in relationship when he quoted from Genesis chapter 2 and you can read it in, in Matthew 19 a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they'll become one flesh and where's that going well it's Paul himself again in Ephesians chapter 5 he says well this is a, a, a profound mystery but I'm talking about Christ and the church it's as if the human love relationship between a man and woman who become married and are joined to his wife and become one flesh that's the worship relationship that's being demonstrated in that relationship on earth and then you get it at the end and you've got again the marriage relationship coming out right in the end of the bible revelation chapter 21 uh, and the john sees a ho the holy city coming down from heaven as a bride dressed perfectly for her husband. But actually, if we go back to Song of Solomon, show me your face, let me hear your voice. And you see, this is the thing then about the worship song. Now we've talked about psalms which declare where we're at, whether good place, bad place, 
strongness, weakness, whatever, the hymns that put the thinking in, and we all need that as well, and the song, oh, that's all about relationship, the immediacy of our relationship, based on that verse from Song of Songs, show me your face, let me hear your voice. A few years ago we wrote this song, let me see your face, and it's really all about uh, the relationship initially in the musical between Mary Magdalene and Jesus, and uh, who sings to what? Mary Magdalene sings to Jesus, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, but actually Jesus also sings back. It's like the, the more simple we get in our lyrics of worship songs, the more reversible they are. So you got that, let me see your face, or oh, let me hear your voice, do not turn or do not hide from me. If you think about those words, they can be reversed. You can hear them sung to you by God, just as much as we can sing to him, because it's we worship because he first worshipped us. We love because he first loved us. We're going to listen from that album of Mary Magdalene to Gordon Lee and Caroline Finney. Join in and then receive the words of love from Jesus. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Let me see your face. Oh, let me hear your voice. Do not turn, oh, do not hide from me. There is no one else who can compare with you. Your loveliness I see. For I have chosen you, will be near to you. I'll stay close by your side To the end of time I'll always be with you I love you You are mine Let me hear your voice Do not turn, oh do not hide from me There is no one else Who can compare with you Your loveliness I see I have chosen you, I have chosen you. We'll, be near to you. we'll be near to you, I'll stay close by your side, to the end of time, I'll always be with you, I love you.
In his first epistle, John writes, See what love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what this is all about, receiving his love, letting him see our face and us seeing him. It's all about relationship and it's all actually therefore about worship. Because as John was also to say in his first epistle, we love because he first loved us. You see, worship is a response to his love. We're going to conclude today with a celebration of uh, dared to write a new tune again to, to an old hymn. And this wonderful hymn, I Worship the King, uh, words written, my word, looking at the dates, back in the early 1800s. But wonderful words, and I thought we'd just put them to a different tune. I still like Hanover, but here's another one. But there's a chorus, and I'd like to just teach you the, the chorus. Because the chorus is simple enough, we're going to try and do it with harmony. And here, here, listen to these chords. So it goes, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship. And then you start the verse again, that will help you out with that. But you see, when you've got simple chords like this. So you might want to be a bass, you go, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship. Make your own harmony up, then you might be an alto. Oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship. A soprano go. And tell him, oh worship, oh worship, oh worship. Take it where you like, because the thing about the chords, when you know where they're going, you can make it up as you go along. When we get to the very end, I want to warn you, we'll have gone into a different key. Oh, worship, oh, worship. And then we get to the very end. Oh, worship, oh, worship, oh, king. Or if you fancy yourself as a tenor or a soprano, king. Or something in between. But let's conclude with just worshipping this wonderful God who loves us in Jesus and the King of the universe wants to become the King of our heart and the lover of our soul. Oh, let's just enjoy worshipping him together.
It breathes through the air, it shines in the light. It spreads from the hills and descends to the plain. That sweet light is lovely. Distilled in the dew of the rain. Oh, hush, 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 o